Hello everyone, my name is Belko and today we're taking a look at the Paladin. This is by request from my Know Your Role video, so I am going to frame it once again in that discussion and we're going to talk about how the Paladin can fill the role of your frontline, your party face, your striker, and a secondary healer all in one class. First up, the race. Come launch, you're going to be able to assign your ability score modifiers to pretty well anywhere you want. You're going to get a plus two and a plus one using Tasha's rules, which means I'm not going to talk about all the races. There's so many small little bonuses that you can get, and I'll make a separate video, probably post launch, talking about all the various options and where you might want to use them and the kind of roles and things you could potentially consider when picking a race. But really what it comes down to is pick whatever you're going to like for your character. So here is the ability scores I would recommend. And this is once again meant to emulate how it's going to be on launch. So I have my plus one in strength and my plus two in charisma in theory. Um, you know, in the early access, I have a bonus point for being a half elf, but you actually lose that in the launch edition. So you're just going to get a plus one and a plus two, which means your final ability scores are going to look something like this. You'll have the ability to have two 16s, a 14, two tens and an eight, giving you a character with some very clear strengths um, and some definite weaknesses as well. So for a paladin, we care about really three stats quite a bit. So we have strength obviously is going to be for attack rolls and damage rolls as well as a front line. We want to use this for shoving people around. So nice to have some strength. We also care about constitution because we're a frontline character. We're going to be in the thick of things up at the very front taking damage. So we want some health to make sure we don't just collapse. And then all obviously as a paladin, this is our primary casting stat. Interestingly, in the early access clan, at least it does not say that this is for paladins, but this is for paladins. We care about this. So uh, you want to make sure you don't dump this. And there actually are quite a few abilities that make charisma very, very attractive for a paladin. Later on, you'll get the ability to share uh, your charisma modifier, which is for us right now, a plus three as a saving throw bonus to everyone near you. That is bonkers good. So there's a few sort of unwritten things about charisma for paladins uh, that you don't necessarily get to notice that make it incredibly attractive. So this is a really good start for your build. You could potentially drop this to a four and instead bump this up with your bonus point. Um, to uh, 16 and go for like 16 constitution instead of 16 charisma uh, come release but i think this is this is how i would do it there are but you, you can play around obviously you could also not be strength and go for a dexterity based paladin and then depending on your race and backgrounds you could do a few other different things that would give you potentially the ability to even be a bit of a scout but because we want to make a frontline character, I like my frontline characters having high strength specifically to take advantage of shoving, which is super fun. So with all of that said, let's talk about our origin for right now and talk about the background. I'm going to go with soldier because it gives me athletics proficiency and intimidation proficiency. This is going to help me be better at shoving and climbing and jumping and getting into position and moving enemies out of position, which is what I want for my frontline character. And then intimidation just gives me another skill for being a face for the party. In terms of my actual skills, I'm taking insight and persuasion once again, because I want this character to be great at talking to people. So this gives me two charisma based skills that are used in conversation in intimidation and persuasion. And it also gives me insight, which I, I've dumped my wisdom. So, you know, this is going to let me have a little bit. I would arguably dump intelligence over wisdom, though, and then I would have a plus two there. And then finally, I have my plus five into athletics, which is going to let me shove those pesky goblins around. No problem. So this is generally how you want your skills and ability set up. Now, let's talk about the actual goodies of a paladin. So you have Oath of Devotion, Oath of the Ancients. You also have Oathbreaker and Oath of Vengeance, which are not in the early access client. And let's talk a little bit about what these oaths are going to give you. So Oath of the Ancients is going to give you, in addition to the regular class features of Lay on Hands and Divine Sense, which all Paladins are going to get, 
you're going to get healing radiance. So this is your oath channel ability. You get one of these per short rest at level one, and you're going to be able to use this and it's going to heal everybody. Uh, you, said, you see it does three healing and it's a bonus action in a small area. So this gives you a little bit more healing as a paladin if you want to go Oath of the Ancients. And then Oath of Devotion would give you Holy Rebuke. Now we want a frontline character. So I'm going to actually take Oath of Devotion, which is more of that like Holy Knight, whereas the Oath of the Ancients is a bit more of a nature knight. They have some more healing things and nature-y themed stuff later and with ensnaring strike and stuff like that. Um, you don't actually get to see right away all the options that are unlocked, but I'm going to level up a character to level three to show you some additional goodies. So for now, just trust me when I say we're going to go Oath of Devotion because it is pretty good for being a frontline. Um, we're going to kind of ignore Holy Rebuke, though, because it's not very good. Holy Rebuke takes your channel Oath Charge. It takes an action. It lasts only two turns and your ally has to take damage for it to trigger. And this uh, rebuke damage is only 1d4, which is not amazing. And yeah, it could trigger multiple times, but if you're triggering this more than three or four times, your ally is dead. So not ideal. You don't even want your allies being attacked in general with this build. You'd rather just use your turn sl slamming them with your hammer. So um, holy rebuke sucks, but later on you get better things. In terms of your actual class features, Lay on Hands is great. You get Lay on Hand charges in Baldur's Gate 3. It's not like the tabletop where you just have a pool of hit points. You could just spread out as you want. This is you're a little bit more limited in how many you use, but it's a very similar ability. They just force you to kind of lump them together a little bit more. And then Divine Sense is a bonus action. You turn it on and it gives you advantage against Celestial Fiends and Undeads on attack rolls. So this is situationally very useful as well. A little bit more powerful than just knowing that they're around in the tabletop version. And yeah, onward to level two. All right, level two is where you get access to Divine Smite. This is why you became a paladin. You want to smite enemies with your righteous fury, and this does it amazingly well. So Divine Smite lets you take your spell slots and convert them into 2d8 radiant damage for one level spell slot. This also increases by a d8 per level of spell slot. So if you're doing a second level spell slot, you're doing 3d8 radiant. So it's amazing, incredibly powerful. Also, when you're critting, these are additional die that you're rolling. So if you're an orc paladin with a battle axe or, or a great axe rather, and you're critting and then you're divine smiting at the same time, you're just rolling a fistful of dice and things turn into mist in front of you. You also get a fighting style at level two. So let's talk about the fighting styles really quickly, and then we're gonna dive into the spells. And I wanna go over those quickly because I could talk way too much about each individual spell. So first up, defense. Plus one bonus to armor class when wearing armor. This is gonna be great no matter what you do as a paladin. And I would recommend taking defense if you're unsure or if you're brand new to the game, like for myself, I haven't played a ton of the first act in Baldur's Gate 3. And obviously we haven't played anything beyond that. So I don't know what kind of amazing magical equipment is lying around. I don't know if I want to be sword and board or if I want to be a great weapon fighter. And I like that versatility. So if I take defense, it's going to let me just use whatever weapons I find for my paladin and I can be a little bit more versatile. Dueling gives you plus two damage if you're using a one hander. It's really strong if you want to be sword and board, gives you a little bit more damage. And obviously as a sword and board paladin, you're going to have a lot more AC than a great weapon fighter, specifically that two more. Um, so it is, it is great to kind of keep your damage up to par while being tanky. I love dueling as well. It is probably my my preferred play style of the sword and board paladin. Because you're already doing so much damage with your smite that I find the great weapon fighting, it doesn't add that much more damage and you're losing a lot of defense. So it is worth considering as well. Next, great weapon fighting as a fighting style, I find a little bit underwhelming. It feels really good on the tabletop when you're physically rolling dice and you get to re-roll those ones and twos, but in Baldur's Gate 3, it's I find you just don't notice it as much and it, it, it doesn't feel great. It's fine, it's gonna increase your damage a little bit, but you will probably hardly notice it. And once again, the problem with dueling and great weapon fighting is this really is locking you into specific weapons. 
you obviously will be able to respec in the full release of the game so you could potentially mitigate that downside by just respecing if you find a really nice weapon you want to use but defense is just always going to be good and you don't necessarily need to ever respec whether you find an amazing two-hander or an amazing shield or an amazing one-handed weapon you're always going to be able to use it and get the full benefit of your fighting style uh, finally protection it's too situational for my taste. You require an ally to be right up there with you in the front line. And with only four party members in Baldur's Gate 3, I find my compositions don't typically have room for two characters being in the front line. So I might have a skirmisher and then a support caster and then a blaster character or something like that. So um, I don't necessarily have two characters side by side as a front line. Um, this is not going to be used very often. So I just don't think it's worth it. Now, in terms of the spells, there's one thing you need to consider, and that's every single spell slot is potentially a cast of Divine Smite. So whenever you're evaluating a spell, you need to ask yourself, is it better to cast Divine Smite? And most of the time, the answer is yes, because that's what we want to be doing. But we can potentially take a few spells that are going to be situationally useful, and that's what I've done here. So I'm just going to talk about the spells I chose, and we'll go from there. So we have Bless. It lasts for nine turns. It's concentration. It takes your action, but it has a huge area of effect. This is something that's great. You pop on your group right before an encounter. If you see some spooky boys up ahead, throw this on and then dive into combat. Um, it's, it's fantastic for that. Uh, I would always have at least one character with Bless. Probably doesn't need to be your front line, though. And there is a problem if you have your frontline using concentration spells is that whenever they're taking damage, they have to make those concentration saving throws. Fortunately, you're going to have a pretty good concentration saving throw as a paladin because you have that constitution score of probably at least 14. However, uh, you can kind of feel like you're wasting slots when your concentration is lost. Next, obviously, you can take cure wounds as just like a backup heal. Generally speaking, you have lay on hands, though. It's not super required, but you could do something like that as well. Compelled Duel is okay. The main advantage is it's a bonus action. So this really just gets enemies focusing in on you as opposed to your squishy allies. So there's some situations where you might want to use this. And as a bonus action, it's not necessarily going to be too much of an opportunity cost. But you do have to ask yourself, would it be better to just to do an extra 2d8 radiant damage to that enemy and just kill them right now instead of making them walk over to me? So... Once again, very situationally, this is going to be useful, but you really need to consider what those situations are. And next, Shield of Faith increases your armor by two, lasts forever as long as you can concentrate on it. This is fantastic. It makes you even tankier as a frontline. This is probably what I would be focusing on for my concentration and not worry about the other things. Now, let's talk about some of the other spells really quickly um, because it is worth noting that they they all have their uses but the best part about being a paladin is these are prepared spells these are not known spells so you can always switch them out play around and find what's going to work for you so you obviously have searing smite thunderous smite and wrathful smite i find most of the time just using your divine smite is going to be better so i typically avoid these thunderous smite is really fun you get to knock enemies away but the other ones just don't do enough damage because really you have to take into the opportunity cost of using a spell slot to do that 2d8 damage right now versus doing you know 1d6 it does last 10 turns but you actually would need to hit at least three different targets with this while maintaining your concentration for it to be equal to your divine smite damage so i rather just use divine smite tw twice in a row and do way more burst damage um, something like Divine Favor is a very similar thing. It lasts three turns, gives you an extra 1d4 radiant damage on your attacks. Um, this does not even come close to how good Divine Smite is. It's just simply not worth it. Uh, obviously, the arguments for these spells are that you can stack them with Divine Smite. So as you get to higher levels, you can pop Divine Favor and use Divine Smite um, to really stack damage. So there are some times where you would want to do this, but... I find it's better just to save your spell slots at lower levels, especially, and just do some smiting. Maybe keep a couple heals ready to go, or even a bless to augment your entire party is going to increase some damage. But you have to think about, are you actually getting 2d8 radiant damage worth of value out of these spells? So 
that is level two on to level three. So level three, you get an additional spell slot and you get an additional prepared spell, which we're not going to talk about too much more, but we're going to dive into specifically the Oath of Devotion for this build, our frontline face striker healer build, and you get a couple of cool goodies. So you actually get protection from good and evil as a always prepared spell. So you don't have to worry about taking that as a prepared spell, which is kind of nice. It has some utility. You also get sacred weapon this is a channel oath ability which is going to be amazing your sacred weapon means you get to add your charisma modifier to attack rolls so remember when i said sometimes it might be worth it to actually have 16 charisma at the beginning of the game now that would give you a plus eight to hit at level three it's when you have your sacred weapon activated that is going to make you incredibly powerful in melee combat. You are very, very rarely going to miss. It'll last for 10 turns. It does take an action, but you can pop this right before an encounter. And there's no concentration on this or anything, so you can uh, you know, pre-buff and, and go wild. You also get Sanctuary as an always prepared spell. I love Sanctuary as a frontline character. It's a bonus action, and it does not require concentration. So that's huge because it's gonna let you protect your allies. And what Sanctuary does in Baldur's Gate 3, it just it just says until the affected enemy, or entity rather, attacks or harms another creature, it cannot be targeted by enemy attacks. So in the pen and paper version, they actually make a wisdom saving throw when they try to target the enemy, and then that will determine whether or not they can target them. Otherwise, they have to choose a new target. So Sanctuary here just means your ally cannot be attacked. This is fantastic. You throw this on a healer or a support character or a controller. And as long as they're not doing damage or attacking, they can keep doing their role. You know, your bard is throwing out inspiring words and using their heals and their fog clouds or their, you know, hideous laughters or whatever it is. And they're not attacking, but they're still being really useful and they just cannot be attacked. So this lets them get into really advantageous positions, maybe take the high ground before unloading a really powerful attack. Um, it also, if your rogue is in the back line, for example, and is getting really low, you can throw Sanctuary on them and let them get out of the way, get up to the healer, top up, or potentially just throw this on them for a one turn where the enemy doesn't hit them. And then once it's back around to that striker's turn, they're going to take them out. So it just, you know, negates an attack for for a bonus action um, obviously it does take a spell slot so you're constantly doing that math of is this worth a divine smite and i think situationally sanctuary absolutely is and then finally you get turn the unholy so this is the very iconic ability where the divine classes the paladins and the clerics can turn the undead or the unholy and you also can turn fiends with this. So this means that they are going to use their turn to run away as fast as possible. It ends upon taking damage, but when you turn an enemy, you don't turn yourself into an undead, but when you turn an enemy, they don't take actions, bonus actions, or reactions other than dash, and they use their turn to get away from you. They become terrified of you. And I mean, let's be honest, you're a righteous ball of holy fury. Um, who wouldn't be terrified? So you get to send these enemies flying. It's situationally pretty useful. It does take a channel oath charge, so it is now competing with sacred weapon. And this is why we're not worried about that silly rebuke ability, because as this uh, you can see now, sacred weapon is probably what we're going to be using that channel oath charge on. And then every once in a while, you have some spooky zombie or something you're going to send off into the abyss. Um, it does take an action though, and you so you still need to do the math of like, is this worth, is this worth that action, or should I just be taking my turn, using my pre-combat sacred weapon and my divine smite to just turn that vampire into dust, and yeah. So that's level three. This is a very solid build. If you go for Oath of Devotion, you're going to have an amazing frontline character that's really durable, has a lot of fun utility spells, and will do a crap load of damage with their Divine Smite. And yeah, let's talk about multi-classing. When it comes to multi-classing, Paladin are 
core in many of the most powerful combinations of classes in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, though some of them are a little bit cheesy. But it's all thanks to Charisma being such a common caster attribute, and Paladins love having spell slots. So obviously some great choices are Bard and Sorcerer, because they get additional spell slots as full casters, and going into either Bard or Sorcerer will give you additional utility for your paladin, but they will make you a little bit squishier because you're not going to have as big of hit dice. So something to consider there. One of my personal favorite combinations is actually going into Valor Bard all the way up to level six and then taking a couple levels of paladin for Divine Smite. But arguably this is more of a bard that just happens to borrow Divine Smite. So we're paladins and we want to look at what's something that's really going to augment our abilities. <clears throat> and for that, we want to look at Warlock, and as long as you're satisfied with framing your RP around an Oathbreaker or someone who's, you know, made some dubious deals to augment their powers, Warlock makes a fantastic addition to the Paladin kit for a couple of reasons. One, Eldritch Blast. So Eldritch Blast is an amazing cantrip. It scales with character level, not necessarily class level, and it uses your charisma. And if you take two levels of Warlock, you can get Agonizing Blast which is going to give you your charisma modifier as a damage bonus. And at fifth level, you get to use two blasts per cast, which means you are going to be a ranged paladin in a lot of ways. You're going to be keeping up with warlocks for damage for most of the single target damage. And then in melee, you're going to blow them out of the water with your divine smites. And speaking of divine smite, at second level of warlock, you have two packed spell slots, which means these are spell slots that count as level one spell slots, and they come back every time you do a short rest. And these are in addition to all your other paladin spell slots. So you're going to have a few extra spell slots to use your divine smite with that come back really frequently. And you can even grab something like hex that will further augment your single target damage and would also be a good combination with your Eldritch Blast. And yeah, lots of fun options for being a Paladin Warlock. It's a really powerful combination. It's kind of fun, definitely worth playing around with. And that is the Paladin video. So we talked about how you can make a frontline character being Oath of Devotion, took it up to level three, talked about some spells and abilities to get you started. And yeah, I've been having so much fun talking about all the classes in Baldur's Gate 3. I'm super excited. We are about a week out from launch and I cannot wait to play this game. I have a lot more video ideas in mind. There's just so much to talk about. I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for 20 years and this game has honestly been a dream for me. It's been so much fun and I'm having a blast. Once again, I appreciate all the support. If you want, you can subscribe to the channel. It is really helping me. Um, I cannot believe how well received these videos have been. Um, and this is just, you know, the D&D nerds dream of just talking about the game they love. And I'm glad any of my experience or insights have been interesting to you. So yeah, thanks again for watching and I will catch you in the next one.